think the IoT. All right. Yeah, it looks better. Uh, hello, I am back. I said I was going to do a second stream last week, but uh, the day I set aside to do that, I forgot that my dad needed to use this room, so I couldn't do it that week. Uh, feels like I'm way over this direction. I don't know. But yeah, so I lied and said I and did not end up doing a second stream last week, but that's fine. Um, I'm back today. Had a nice weekend. I went running this morning. I'm so like I'm sleepy. I can feel it now. It's like I went running and it's like had some lunch now before streaming. So it's like now I can feel like the sleepiness setting in, you know, that afternoon nap time. Um, anyways, so uh, I said we were going to start this today. Let me get that right up there. Zeros and Ones by Sadie Plant. Um, so Sadie Plant is the founder, co-founder, one of the founders of the CCRU. She started it in, I think, 1993 when she was hired at the University of Warwick in England, which is where like Nick Land went and Mark Fisher and like all those guys. It's like the University of Warwick is like the main um, continental philosophy department in England, like the big one, probably the only one, because like England and the United States are very analytical philosophy. Whereas, you know, Europe is continental European philosophy. So Warwick has a lot of influence of like the French theorists of Foucault, Deleuze, and um, German ones, Kant and Hegel and such. Um, so that's why like Nick Land and Fisher all deal with Deleuze and stuff such which is unusual i guess for english philosophers you know they're more analytical um anyway so city plant started the ccru um in 93 i think nick land was like involved then too it was originally supposed to be like just like a normal research thing and even had like an office in the philosophy department i guess but eventually when plant left in the mid 90s uh they kind of just went off the rails and became their own thing for a little bit but um yeah so this is the so that's why i'm reading her because i wanted to go through like all the writings by the various people involved with the ccru and so this is her most famous book book uh she has three of them that i know of off the top of my head this is obviously the most famous one because it deals with cyber feminism that's what the ccru was originally supposed to be was like a cyber feminist research group um sadie plant also taught at the university of birmingham so there's a cultural studies research center that used to be there that was very big uh in laying the foundations or influencing the cultural studies field i think semiotics too and um they combined a lot of like marxism feminism and uh communications all that kind of stuff i think i don't know a whole lot of, i don't know who, <clears throat> i don't know i do not know a whole lot about it but it is like a was an important one i think it shut down like 2002 i think is when it shut down right about the time the ccru shut down too which was 2003 ironic i guess um but yeah so she's kind of been in a lot of important things you don't hear a whole lot about her i guess at least i think i don't know how much she does recently compared to like mark fisher or nick land or a lot of like the urbanomic guys of grant and mckay um bracier but she's still important she's like the found i think i assume she's important as a sort of foundational person for what i want to lo learn more about which is the ccru and like all of their philosophy and the things around them. So I'm going to get a drink of water if that's all right here. Can I just put that right there? Oh, I can. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, let's just get into this then. Um, I do want to thank the people who donated because 
this is where that money went buying this book so i thank you for that again um i appreciate it and helping out to buy some of the books for reading on here there's a coffee link in the description is what i'm talking about um and yeah i keep track of like the money just so i know oh this is that's how much like it's been donated i need to spend that you know on books basically so for this channel reading books um anyways so there's no chapters in this it's just basically like short sections like a page or two under headings so when i edit the stream titles i'll probably just put page numbers obviously using this edition which is the uh fourth fourth estate paperback edition uh 1998 edition wow <laughs> has not been updated i guess re anytime soon recently because it was published in 97 so it's like the first edition really S second edition i guess i don't know uh so anyways um zeros and ones the subtitle of this which is not on the cover is digital women and the new culture and the new techno culture which i think i need to add the stream with that but anyways um so i think my audio is up i think everything is good just one quick check I had the all this was taken down friday so i had to put everything back together and just making sure like everything is uh where it's supposed to be which it looks like it is but anyways all right um i might need to put my camera in focus now that i think about it um anyways so preamble those are the days when we are all at sea, it seems like yesterday to me. Species, sex, race, class. In those days, none of the in those days, none of this meant anything at all. No parents, no children, just ourselves. Strings of inseparable strings of inseparable sisters, warm and wet, indistinguishable one from the other, gloriously indiscriminate, promiscuous and fused. No generations, no future, no past. An endless geographic plane of micro of micro meshing pulsing quanta, limitless webs of interacting blendings, leakings, mergings, weaving through ourselves, running rings around each other, heedless, needless, aimless, careless, thoughtless, amok. Folds and foldings, plying and multiplying, placating and replicating. We had no definition, no meaning, no way of telling each other apart. We were whatever we were up to at that time. Free exchanges, microprocesses finely tuned. Free exchanges, microprocesses micro finely tuned. Polymorphous transfers without regard for borders and boundaries. I'm just gonna move this. There is nothing to hang. There was nothing to hang on to, nothing to be grasped, nothing to protect or be protected from. Insides and outsides did not count. We gave no thought to any such things. We gave no thought to anything at all. Everything was there for the taking then. We paid no attention. It was all for free. It, has been, it had been this way for tens, thousands, millions, billions of what we of what were later defined as years. We had thought about it. We would have said it would go on forever, this fluent, fluid world. And then something occurred to us. The climate changed. We couldn't breathe. It grew terribly cold, far too cold for us. Everything we touched was poisonous. Noxious gases and thin toxic airs flooded our oceanic zone. Some said we brought it on ourselves that all our activity had backfired, that we had destroyed our environment by accident, that we had destroyed our environment by an accident we had provoked. There were rumors of betrayal and sabotage, whisperings of alien invasion and mutant beings from another ship. Only a few of us, only a few of us survived the break. Conditions were so terrible that many of those who did pull through wished they had died. We mutated to such an extent 
that we are unrecognizable to ourselves, bonded, banded together in units of a kind which, like everything, had been unthinkable before. We found ourselves working as slave components of systems whose scales and complexities we could not comprehend. Were we their parasites? Were they ours? Either way, we became components to our own imprisonment. To all, to all intents and purposes, we disappeared. Subtly, subtly, they become invisible. Wondrously, wondrously, they become soundless. They are thus able to be, they are thus able to be their enemies' fates. By Sun Tzu, The Art of War. That sounds like a... So in Earth's early history, there was a thing called the Great Oxygenation Event, which is where the uh, anaerobic bacteria, like early organisms, produce a lot of oxygen that was toxic to them. And when there's so much oxygen in the atmosphere, it like leaked into the oceans and uh, caused like the first possible mass extinction where like a lot of uh, anaerobic bacteria and prokaryotic cell prokary prokaryotic organisms were wiped out and then the eukaryotic and then the eukaryotic cells uh, is where they came in it kind of laid, laid the open the door for them to evolve and produce all kinds of stuff so I think that's what that was referring to or maybe like an ice age or something like that. I think like an ice age was involved in that too. Um, yeah, I'm thirsty today. Sorry. <clears throat> Ada. In 1833, a teenage girl made a machine which she came to regard as a friend. It was a futuristic device which seemed to have dropped into her world at least a century before its time. Later to, be, later to be known as Ada Lovelace, she was then Ada Byron, the only child of, the only child of Annabella, a mathematician who had herself been dubbed Princess of Parallelograms by her husband, Lord Byron. The machine was a difference engine, a calculating system in which the engineer Charles Babbage had been working for many years. We both went to see the thinking machine, for such it seems, last Monday, Annabella wrote in her diary. To the amazement of its onlookers, it raised several it raised several numbers to the second and third powers, and extracted the root of a quadratic equation. While most of the audience gazed in astonishment at the machine, Ada, young as she was, understood its working, and saw the great beauty of the invention. That's Difference Engine is the name of the um, book by um, William Gibson, which started the steampunk uh, genre. So it's kind of ironic to see it referenced here, given that they talk a lot about cyberpunk, which was also started by Gibson or influenced by him. Um, when Babbage had begun work on the Difference Engine, he was interested in the possibility of making machinery to compute arithmetical tables, although he struggled to, per although he struggled to persuade the British government to fund his work, he had no doubt the he had no doubt about the feasibility and the value of such a machine. Isolating common mathematical differences between tab between tabulated numbers, Babbage was convinced that this method of di method of differences supplied a general principle by which all tables might be computed through limited intervals, by one uniform process. By 1822, he had made a small but functional machine, and in the year 1833, an event of great importance in the history of the engine occurred. Mr. Babbage had directed a portion of it, consisting of 16 fingers, to be put together. It was capable of calculating tables having two or three orders of differences, and to some extent, of forming other tables. The action of this portion completely justified the expectations raised and gave a most satisfactory assurance of its final success. Shortly after, this part, shortly after this part of his machine went on public display, 
Babbage was struck by the thought that the difference engine, still incomplete, had already superseded itself. Having in the meanwhile naturally speculated upon the general principles on which machinery for calculation might be constructed, a principle of an entirely new kind occurred to him, the power, the power of which over the most complicated arithmetical operations seemed nearly unbounded. On re-examining his drawings, the new principle appeared to be limited only by the extent of the mechanism it might require. Of the mechanism it might require. If the simplicity of the mechanisms which allow the difference engine to perform addition could be extended to thousands rather than hundreds of components, rather than hundreds of components, a machine could be built which would execute more rapidly the calculations for which the difference engine was intended or that the difference engine would itself be superseded by a far simpler mode of construction. The government officials who had funded Babbage's work on the first machine were not pleased to learn that it was now abandoned in favor of a, were not pleased to learn that it was now abandoned, that it was now to be abandoned in favor of a new set of mechanical processes which were essentially different from those of the difference engine. While Babbage did his best to persuade them that the fact of a new superseding that the fact of a new superseding Oh, sorry. That the fact of a new superseding an old machine in a very few years is one of constant occurrence in our manufactories, and in, and instances might be pointed out in which the advance of invention has been so rapid, and the demand for machinery so great that half-finished machines have been thrown aside as useless before their completion. Babbage's, Babbage's decision to proceed with his new machine was also his break with the bodies which had funded his previous work. Babbage lost the support of the state, but he had already gained assistance of a, of a very different kind. You are a brave man, Ada told Babbage, to give yourself wholly up to a fairy guidance. I advise you to allow yourself to be unresistantly bewitched. No one, she added, knows that almost awful energy and power lie yet undeveloped in that, in that wiry little system of mine. In 1842, Louis Menembria, Louis Menembria, an Italian military engineer, had deposited his sketch of an analytical engine invented by, invented by Charles Babbage in the Bibliothèque Universelle de Genève. Shortly after his appearance, Babbage later wrote, the Countess of Lovelace informed me that she had translated the memoir of Menumbria. Enormously impressed by this work, Babbage invited her to join him in the development of the machine. I asked why she had not herself written an original paper on a subject with which she was so intimately acquainted. To this, Lady Lovelace or to this, Lady Lovelace replied that the thought had not occurred to her. I then suggested that she add some notes to Menembria's memoir, an idea which was immediately adopted. Babbage and Ada, develop Babbage, Babbage and Ada developed an intense relationship. We discussed together the various illustrations that might be introduced, wrote Babbage. I suggested several, but the selection was entirely her own. So also was the algebraic working out of the different pro so was the algebraic working out of the different problems, except indeed that relating to the numbers of Bernoulli, which I had offered to do say which I had which I had offered to do to save Lady Lovelace the trouble. This she sent back to me for an amendment, having detected a grave mistake which I had made in the process. A strong minded woman much like her mother, eh? Wears green spectacles and writes learned books. She wants to upset the universe and play dice with the hemispheres. Women never know when to stop. And, that's a, and that is a quote from William, from William Gibson and Bruce Sterling's the, different Eng, the Difference Engine, the book I was talking about. Uh, Babbage's mathematical errors and many of his attitudes greatly irritated at greatly irritated Ada, while his tendency to blame other bodies for the slow progress of his work was sometimes well-founded. 
when he insisted on pre when he insisted on prefacing the publication of the memoir and her notes with a complaint about the attitude of the British authorities to his work, Ada refused to endorse him. I never can or will support you acting on principles which I consider not only wrong in themselves, but suicidal. She declared Babbage one of the most impracticable, selfish, and intemperate persons one can have to do, one can have to do with and laid down several severe conditions for the continuation of their collaboration. Can you, she asked, with undisguised, imper with undisguised impatience, undertake to give your mind wholly and, un and undividedly as a primary object that no, engagement is to in that no engagement is to interfere with, to the consideration of all those matters in which I shall at times require your intelligence? require your intellectual assistance and supervision and can you promise not to, and can you promise and can you promise not to slur and hurry and hurry things over or to some or to some, ah, or to mislay and allow confusion and mistakes to enter into documents etc ada was she said very much afraid as yet of exciting the powers i know i have over others and the evidence, of which I have certainly been most unwilling to admit, in fact for a long time, considered quite fanciful and absurd. I have therefore carefully refrained from all attempts intentionally to exercise unusual powers. Perhaps this is why her work was simply attributed to AAL. It is not my wish to proclaim who, was, who has written it, she wrote. These are just a few afterthoughts, a mere commentary on someone else's work. But Ada did want them to bear some name. I rather wish to append anything that may tend hereafter to individualize it and identify it with other productions of the said AAL. And for all her apparent modesty, Ada knew how important her notes really were. To say the truth, I am rather amazed at them, and I cannot help being struck quite malegre ma with a really masterly with the really masterly nature of the style and its superiority to that of the memoir itself. Her work was indeed vastly more influential and three times longer than the, than the text to which they were supposed to be mere adjuncts. A hundred years before the hardware had been built, Ada had produced the first example of what was later called computer programming. Ooh. <clears throat> the difference engine was the uh, first computer, technically, kind of. Uh, and Babbage and Lovelace were like the first to develop the computer, kind of ish. Um, <clears throat> matrices. Distinctions between the main bodies of text and all and all the peripheral detail, indices, headings, prefaces. Dedications, appendices, illustrations, references, notes, and diagrams have long been integral to orthodox conceptions of nonfiction books and articles. Authored, authorized, and authoritative, a piece of writing is its own mainstream. Oh. I just completely lost my place there. There it is. It's the sides or backwaters, which might have been, and often are, compiled by anonymous editors, secretaries, copyists, and clerks. And while, they may and while they may well be providing crucial support for a text, which they also connect to other sources, resources, and leads, they are also sidelined and, down they are also sidelined and downplayed. When Ada wrote her footnotes to Menembria's text, her work was implicitly supposed to be reinforcing these hierarchical divisions between centers and margins, authors and scribes. Menembria's memoir was a leading article. Ada's work was merely a compilation of supporting detail, secondary commentary, material intended to back up material intended to back the author up. But her notes made enormous leaps of both quantity and quality beyond a text which Beyond a, text which, 
beyond a text, which turned out merely to be providing the occasion for her work. Only when digital networks arranged themselves in threads and links did footnotes begin, did footnotes begin to walk all over what had once been the bodies of organized texts. Hypertext programs and the net are webs of footnotes without central points, organizing principles, hierarchies. Such networks are unprecedented in terms of their scope, complexity, and the programmatic possibilities of their use. And yet, they are, and yet, they are also, and have always been, imminent to all in every piece of written work. The frontiers of a book, wrote Michel Foucault, long before these modes of writing hypertext or retrieving data from the net emerged, are never clear cut beyond the title. The first are never clear are never clear cut beyond the title, the first lines, and the last full stop, beyond its internal configuration and an autonomous form. It is caught up in a system of references to other books, other texts, other sentences, other sentences other sentences. It is a node with a network. Such complex patterns of cross-referencing have become increasingly possible and also crucial to dealing with the floods of data which have burst the banks of traditional modes of arranging and retrieving information and are now <clears throat> and are now linking and are now leaking through the covers of articles and books, sweeping past the boundaries of the old disciplines, overflowing all the classifications and orders of libraries, schools, and universities. And the sheer weight of data with which the late 20th century finds itself awash is only the beginning of the pressures under which traditional under which traditional media are buckling. If the treatment of an irregular and complex topic cannot be forced in any single direction without curtailing the potential for transfer, it has suddenly become obvious that no topic is a that no topic is as regular and simple as was once assumed. Reality does not run along the neat straight lines of the printed page. Only by crisscrossing the complex topical landscape can the twin goals of highlighting multifaceted can the twin goals of highlighting multifacetedness multifacetedness and establishing multiple connections even be, even begin to be attained. Hypertext makes it hypertext makes it hypertext makes it possible for single and even small numbers of connecting threads to be assembled into a woven interconnectedness in which strength of con in which strength of connection derives from the partial overlapping of many different strands of, connected, of connectedness across cases, rather than from any single strand running through large numbers of cases. It must be evident it must be evident how multifarious and how mutually and how mutually complicated are the considerations, wrote Ada in her own footnotes. There are frequently several distinct sets of effects going on simultaneously, all in a manner independent of each other, and yet to a greater or less degree, exercising a mutual influence. To adjust each to every other, and indeed, even to perceive and trace them out with perfect and indeed, even to perceive and trace them out with perfect correctness and success, entails difficulties whose nature partakes to a certain extent of those involved in every question where conditions are very numerous and intercomplicated, such as, for instance, the estimation of the mutual connect, the estimation of the mutual relations among set, of the mutual relations among statistical phenomena, and for those involved in many other classes of facts. She added, "All and everything is naturally related and interconnected." A volume I could. A volume I could write on this subject. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, the next section is tensions. Just as individual texts have become filaments of infinitely tangled webs, so the digital machines of the late twentieth century. Weave new networks from what was from what were once isolated words, numbers, music, shapes, smells, tactile textures, architectures, and countless channels as yet unnamed. 
media become interactive and hyperactive, the multiplicitous components of an immersive zone, which does not begin with writing, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, which does not begin with writing, it is directly it is directly related rather to the weaving of elaborated figured to the weaving of elaborate figured silks. The yarn is neither metaphorical nor literal, but quite simply material. A gathering of threads which twist and turn through the history of computing, technology, and the sciences and arts. In and out, in and out of the punched holes of automated loops, up and down through the ages of spinning and weaving, back and forth through the fabrication of fabrics, shuttles and looms, cotton and silk, canvas and paper, brushes and pens, typewriters, carriages, telephone wires, synthetic fibers, electrical filaments, silicon strands, fiber optic cables, pixeled screens, telecom lines, the world wide web, the net, and, mat and matrices to come. And matrices to come. Quote, before you run out of the door, consider two things. The future is already set. Only the past can be changed. And if it was worth forgetting, it's not worth remembering. End quote from Pat Cadigan in Fools. Or Pat Cadigan's Fools. And I think I'm actually going to stop there. Because uh, my voice is like really scratchy. I think I got like sick over the weekend a little bit. Um, so yeah. Sorry it's kind of short stream, but yeah, half hour, I guess, 35 minutes. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed. If you made, hope you enjoyed so far. If you made it this far, this sounds this sounds interesting. Kind of a history of computing. A bit, and which is interesting to me. So yeah, um, I guess I will see you Thursday, hopefully. Bye.